Hi everyone. Right, hopefully this is our last lesson going through Macbeth, although I'm sure that later and nearer to your exam, I will come back online and put together some videos for you to show you how to put an essay together. So that will be coming, but probably not until you're in year 11. So um, what we're up to today is we're going to be analysing um, Macbeth's last soliloquy, which is kind of known as the tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow soliloquy. Um, so your title for today's work is Macbeth, Act 5, Scene 5, because that's when he um, performs this soliloquy, the act of playing Macbeth. Beth. And um, I've got a couple of things that I need you to do before we actually get on with um, the annotation with me. Um, what I want you to do, first of all, is to look in the description underneath and download yourself um, and print off a couple of copies of um, the soliloquy from Act 5, Scene 5. It's only small so um, if you're trying to save paper you could probably fit maybe four of them even onto a page if you wanted to and then cut them out and stick them into your exercise books um, but the thing is there is a lot of annotation to go around quite a short little bit so you might want several copies of them if you can't do any printing and you have your own copy of the play, do your best to annotate as much around that as you can, but you probably will need to use lots and lots of shorthand and keep your writing really small for me. Um, failing that, you can just go straight into notes in your exercise book, but then you'll probably need to copy out the quotations. To be honest with you, you could probably just copy out the speech because it is short enough and if you actually copy it out that might help you to learn quotations from it as well because for lots and lots of people actually the process of copying out helps you to memorize things definitely does for me so that's the first thing i need you to do either get your text in front of you um or um to um copy out the text of the soliloquy um, into your exercise book. So you've got something there and you can see the words of this fantastic, depressing speech. The second thing that I want you to do for me, please, is to watch this workshop. So you can see a little screenshot from it here and it's our favourite Ian McKellen way, way back in the day when I was just a little girl in 1979, um, doing a workshop to other actors about what this soliloquy is all about. And it's such amazing analysis that he does and um, that I'd like you to watch this. And if you can, as you're watching it, maybe pause it and make some notes. What I've done um, on the slides that follow is I've made my own notes. So we can go through them together, but it's well worth listening to what he says, because to actually get the actors, the performers perspective really helps you to remember that the genre is drama, that it is um, that Shakespeare's language is living language, which is going to go into the mouth of an actor, and that's going to convey meaning to an audience like now, not 600 years ago. So watch the workshop, and then at the end of the workshop, um, he you, you see him acting out the scene as well, so you can see like how his interpretation comes across to the audience. Okay, so um, most most of the annotations that you're going to see now are straight out of Ian McKellen's mouth. Some of the things I add in to try and make something a bit more detailed or a bit more clear to you, sometimes I zoom in on the language a bit more than he does and sometimes I give my own point of view. So in this soliloquy, um, what Ian, Ian McKellen says is that it's a description of darkness and despair and I've just changed that darkness to depression because I think that the short soliloquy perfectly sums up what depression is all about so it is that kind of darkness that you see and absolute despair there's no hope in your life and the only way out of life is the end of life really that's kind of what this 
soliloquy is all about. He points out that this is Macbeth's last soliloquy in the play. So um, structurally, the soliloquy is almost like um, a real kind of low point, a real moment for the audience to reflect. Macbeth's character has fallen since Act 3, Scene 4. He's fallen so far, like morally, and in terms of leadership, he's become a tyrant and a despot, all the things that we talked about in the previous lessons. Um, and he's hit rock bottom in this speech. Life is meaningless. Um, so it is his last soliloquy. And really, it comes before all the action starts, like the final showdown, the final fight, first with um, young Seaward. And then finally, he faces up to his ultimate enemy, who is Macduff. So um, Macbeth has a chance after this very, very depressing final speech, almost to like bolster himself up and show himself as that warrior is that amazing hand-to-hand -hand fighter so he can at least die with some pride reminding the audience of the man that he used to be whereas in this speech he really has kind of hit rock bottom so he is given a little bit of a reprieve at the end when we see his fantastic fighting um ian mckellen points out that the images in this soliloquy are concrete and what he means by concrete imagery is um, they describe real and recognizable things so when we're looking at that imagery um, as he does we think about the things that he's comparing life mostly to what is he comparing life to all the things he compares life to are things that we can recognize solid concrete things not airy fairy things um, he says, thirdly, that the idea of looking at the words is Shakespeare is really, really helping the actor to, to understand the emotions that Macbeth is feeling so that then the actor can take those lines and make the lines sound as if Macbeth is making it up as he goes along. So he's trying to make it sound like natural speech, Macbeth's natural thought process, which is because it's a soliloquy that's just between Macbeth and the audience, it's the contents of his mind, and it's meant to be just kind of what's coming into his head. So even though it's a beautiful piece of poetic writing, um, it's kind of structured, um, in such a way, like the rhythm of it makes it sound like natural speech. Um, and finally, um, Ian McKellen points out that the speech is mostly written in blank verse. There are a few rule breaks and we'll have a look at those as he does. Okay, so the first thing he, he says he's going to talk about it in terms of the rhythm. So I'll just move myself make myself a bit smaller for a second um and so the first thing he points out is satan comes in and says the queen my lord is dead and if we're counting in that iambic beat the queen so do dumb my lord is dead and you can see there are four missing beats at the end of that line um and that creates a really really long pause and as if that pause isn't long enough We've got another short line here. She should have died hereafter. So here we've got another three or four missing beats, depending on whether you stress the ter on hereafter. She should have died hereafter. So all in all, by the time you count, do dum, do dum, do dum, do dum. That's a good kind of two seconds that the actor needs to pause for before he launches into this soliloquy. And um, what McKellen said was, um, after this long, almost awkward, or dramatic pause, that's when the soliloquy starts. And I've just added in here, he says the soliloquy is to the audience and he talks about where the audience are sitting all around him, as you remember from that kind of black box performance that we saw. Um, he's not talking to Satan. So although it, it doesn't say up here at all, um, exit Satan, um, it, it's 
it is a soliloquy. It's a contents of his mind, and he's talking to the audience, not to his man. Okay. Um, then he um, talks a little bit more about the rhythm in here. Um, so after she should have died hereafter, he says it's straight into the iambic line. There would have been a time for such a word. Did dum did dum did dum did dum did dum. Nice regular iambic rhythm. Um, and he he says the whole speech is about time, and time is mentioned straight away here. And for him, he says this is like the tick-tocking of a clock there would have been a time for such a word and uh, when he puts it like that it does i can't help but but agree with that and on the next uh, slide i mentioned that this is all monosyllabic as well like the kind of tick tock tick tock that he was talking about then he points out that the next line does not follow this iambic rhythm it's um a dactylic rhythm actually tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow um so it's in kind of threes um it, it goes and tomorrow um and it has this sense of making the line drag on whereas this one's got this kind of pace and, and the follow one's got a bit of pace to it there would have been a time for such a word it's really really quick this one kind of drags on tomorrow and tomorrow those long vowel sounds there um and he says that the word tomorrow when you say it three times it becomes almost like a nonsense word and it starts to lose its meaning and he suggests that that could reflect the lack of meaning in Macbeth's own life and that really fits in with these dark themes that that he's already mentioned the depression and the way that time just slows down and drags on when there's no meaning in your life um then in the next line um he compares this to footsteps which i think is cool um creeps in this petty pace from day to day um, and it's still really quite a slow pace, but it's um, beginning to pick up the pace a little bit from tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Um, and he says this idea um, is reflected, but it kind of creates a sound of footsteps here, which reflects this personification, which I'll talk about more when we look closely at language rather than rhythm. Okay, so um, the final a significant thing that he talks about about rhythm is again the last line and missing beats so the last line is signifying nothing and there's either four or five missing beats depending on how many syllables you count in signifying but the missing beats again creates quite a dramatic silence and what this makes audience do is really reflect on that last word there nothing um, because Macbeth's life has descended to nothingness I think that uh, McKellen says Macbeth's life has become devoid of meaning there is no meaning left in his life anymore and actually that's something that I'm going to get you to think about later why is his life devoid of meaning is it because of the death of his wife which brings on this soliloquy um was it Lady Macbeth who give, gave his life meaning is it because he knows that he's facing up to his final battle and he believes that he's invincible and that means that if there's no kind of life or death going on then that makes his life meaningless um i think that's something as i said i'll get you to think about later because there's no right or wrong answer to that it's your personal opinion and the way that you can argue it okay so um we're on to the language and imagery um so you see some like some little bits i'll probably repeat it because sometimes when you're talking about rhythm it can really really lead you into the language and so this a uh, first line again um there would have been a time for such a word um and here i want to talk a bit about meaning um because all through these lessons I've been doing for you, I've said to you, read through No Fear Shakespeare on the Spark Notes. 
Um, so before I started uh, making this video, I had to read through what they said on this particular scene. And I kind of really disagree with what they say in their translation. So Satan says to Macbeth, Queen, my lord is dead. Macbeth says she should have died hereafter. And I don't argue with what they say about that. Hereafter means in the future or later. She should have died later. So Macbeth is kind of suggesting that this was a really bad time for her to die. He's just about, he's putting his armour on. He's just about to go into battle um, against this alliance of um, Scots and English. Um, and it is a bad time for her to die. Now, the next line, um, what No Fear Shakespeare says is there would have been a time for such a word means everyone dies eventually. Um, so, um, she, yeah, she should have died later, but everyone's going to die anyway. So, so what? So that's kind of what they say. But I don't really agree with that. I think that um, I think that what this line means, there would have been a time for such a word is that if she had died later, she um her, her death could have been um like mourned properly and people could would have had time to give it attention and to feel sorrow and for me that's kind of what he means like when he says a word because um McKellen, he says, what, what is the word? What's the word that he's talking about here? And for me, that's, that's what that line means. But again, the whole point of English literature is whoever wrote Spark Notes, No Fear Shakespeare has got one interpretation. I've got like a really different interpretation for what that means. My interpretation makes Macbeth seem a much nicer character. Spark Notes's um, interpretation makes Macbeth seem extremely harsh and almost emotionally unaffected by his uh, partner in greatness's um, death. Um, like um, you can see lots and lots of different versions of this speech and most of the time the actors do seem really cut up by Lady Macbeth's death but again I guess that's their, their interpretation so um and so that's what I think that one means but obviously you've got an alternative there um as we said previously the rhythm of this there would have been a time for such a word um it's monosyllabic it's like the ticks of a clock it represents the passage of time um and, and I guess that's what it is. You know, if we had time on our side, um, we could have mourned Lady Macbeth's, um, Macbeth's passing in a much nicer way. Um, and then we've got this line, but I want to look at the words this time. So creeps in this petty pace from day to day. And he said the rhythm makes it sound like footsteps. Um, and I would agree because if you have a look, you've got the P's and the T's and the D's. These are harsh plosive consonants, the kind that you make by the sound exploding from the front of your mouth. Um, and that's almost um, replicating the sound of footsteps walking along stone. Um, however, probably more importantly, is this is an example of personification. So it's saying the petty pace creeps in from day to day. So he's almost um, saying life is like slowly plodding through each day. Petty pace means a slow, pathetic pace that you're moving at. So slowly creeping through each day. So not kind of living your life and enjoying your life, but just creeping through every day. That's what life has become to Macbeth himself. Then thinking about um, language again, and McKellen suggests that syllable bell has got the word bell at the end. I'm not convinced by this interpretation, but then bells have been seen throughout Macbeth um, and a bell would be found on a clock chiming the hour. Um, and it is all about time. So the last syllable of recorded time. And that could be like the bell tolling for for King Duncan as well. If you remember, Lady Macbeth uh, rang the bell as a symbol um, that Duncan's time was up. So definitely, this idea about bells and time are are a feature of the play 
as I said, I'm not quite as convinced um, at McKellen's interpretations there. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the passage of time, all these yellows in a minute, but we haven't got through them all yet. So we'll have a look at the next word which he talked about. And this is this idea. All our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Um, and what I think um, this means, our yesterdays, so I'll have a look on the next page where I've annotated this. I think he means by all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. What he's saying is all the choices, I put bad choices here, but all the choices we've made in the past lead our way towards death. I think in Macbeth's case, this is definitely um, the fact that he's made some bad choices. And I think that a lot of the bad choices he made, he was encouraged to do that by Lady Macbeth. So I feel that although in the speech somewhat he's kind of mourning and missing Lady Macbeth, and I think sometimes he references her indirectly, I think also he feels some regret for the bad choices that he's made, which have only brought him closer to his own death. So let's go back over here. So our yesterdays have lighted fools away to dusty death. He talked about fool and about the fact that it's got a double meaning. So a fool could be a foolish person. He said, who is it? The, the village idiot, um, the local yokel. Um, so kind of the stupidest person in your locality. So it can mean that you're an idiot. Um, but he also talks about fool, a fool being a paid jester. So old fashioned guy wearing the tricorn hats with the bells on it, who is paid to entertain. And that's significant, the second meaning that is a paid entertainer, because following this, Shakespeare goes on to develop an extended metaphor comparing life to a really rubbish actor on the stage and he said that's what life is like a really bad actor who just has his moment on the stage and then and then vanishes um so this idea of a fool being a professional a paid entertainer um kind of starts off that extended metaphor that goes through that middly kind of section there okay um he goes on to talk about out, out, brief candle. And um, McKellen points out that the last time we saw a candle in the play was Lady Macbeth holding a candle and she wouldn't let the candle be put out. Um, and that was really significant because we know um, from the motif of darkness in the play that darkness represents evil or the evil that happens in the play happens by darkness and when Lady Macbeth is sleepwalking she's terrified of darkness because she doesn't know what evil might be around so by having that candle with her um, it represents a tiny glimmer of, of hope for her that She's not going to head straight to hell, if you like, to the darkness um, of and evil of hell. Um, so out out brief candle certainly makes us think that Macbeth is alluding to Lady Macbeth at this point. Um, she was the last person to have a candle, and now she's dead. Um, and McKellen points out, um, this, this speech, this section of the speech and the idea about the candle is about Lady Macbeth's death, but it's about this fool's death, the fool who's walking the way to dusty death. But it's about Macdeath, Macbeth's death as well. So, um, so although we could think about the brief candle being the fragile Lady Macbeth, actually it's about the fragility of life. And I've just made a little um, note down here. That it's certainly not just Shakespeare who uses this um, candle metaphor. The idea of a small feeble flame of a candle it burns down the wax and sometimes the wax represents like the length of your life and the flame represents your life kind of wearing away. There's a song uh, called Candle in the Wind by Elton John. It is quite a famous song. 
Um, and it's about the death of Marilyn Monroe and he compares her to a candle in the wind. And obviously if you're a, ca a candle in the wind, the flame is really, really vulnerable and it can flicker out really easily. Um, so, so it is a metaphor which is commonly used, the idea of the flame of candle representing life. Um, that's why sometimes um, Catholic people particularly will light a candle to represent um, a lost loved one. Um, and then um, he made a lovely point, uh, McKellen, kind of an AO3 social and historical context point. When Shakespeare wrote Macbeth, um, it was when indoor theatres were just starting. Um, so the one that Shakespeare's, uh, the King's Men, they were called, um, where they used to perform was in um, Blackfriars. And Blackfriars, um, they would light all the candles to create a kind of um, stage effect, uh, lighting effect on the stage. And then they'd have an interval halfway through where they'd have to trim all the candles and, and re-light them. So actually, literally, the candles would go out in the interval and then they'd have to be replaced or relit in the second half. So this idea of candles might have been something that was in the forefront of Shakespeare's mind when he wrote that too. Um, and then uh, McKellen said that even nowadays, um, theatre companies have actors that they keep on their books known as walking gentlemen. Um, so a walking gentleman is someone who's available in the theatre company to kind of be an extra. They don't have any lines, but they'll go on um, and just do a walk on part. I think nowadays we call them an extra in a film. Um, and, and he points out that life is not even a walking gentleman life is a walking shadow someone who's meant to be there but barely even recognizable so that's how much Macbeth is valuing life at this point really really depressing um it's um that that's how he he sees life as something less than a walk on extra um and then um the last one if we come back to this one um, about the passage of time and hopefully you can see I've annotated um, highlighted these in yellow and McKellen points out that this speech is all about the passage of time um, there would have been a time for such a word um, the last syllable of recorded time so it's like eternity we've got down here but eternity the last syllable of recorded time like the end of, of the world and then we move through and we've got today and we've got yesterday we've got our tomorrows up here and then even the minute kind of um unit of time the hour as well so he's saying that a human life is just like an hour on the stage so actually you can link that to um the way that time is portrayed in a poem like Ozymandias as well actually that human life is just like a grain of sand in the desert and when we put that into like an egg timer or a sand timer that's all our life is like just a grain of sand it's a really similar idea going on here okay and the last little bit of language and imagery because obviously we've talked about this one already um Back to the fools, this is, as I said previously, an extended metaphor comparing life to a bad actor. And I'm just pointing out here to develop the point that McKellen makes that um, acting has been a metaphor throughout the play. Macbeth, when he's called Thane of Cordor, says, why do you dress me in borrowed robes? It's kind of like that costume that you put on to become something that he feels he's not, something he hasn't earned. It's like at the end of the play when he dresses the castle in the banners um, to try and make it look ready for war, to make it look like the king's castle with the king's banner on the outside. It's like Lady Macbeth constantly tell him about to pretend to be something that he isn't look like the innocent flower but be the serpent under it sleek all your rugged looks and be the jovial host um she throughout the play the macbeths have developed this idea about outward appearances covering up their true thoughts. So it seems really apt that in this really depressing final soliloquy, Macbeth should reflect 
upon this idea that actually life is just putting on a really bad show. Life is just like being a really bad actor in a bad show. Um, so I would argue that the alliteration here on a poor player creates quite an aggressive tone and quite a sneering tone. Life's just a poor player that struts and presses hour upon the stage. And McKellen gave us a little bit of AO3, a little bit of social historical context here that struts and frets is all about these hired walking shadows beating out the rhythm of the language for the actors. I've put on drums, but actually he says on all sorts of um, percussive instruments that they would use. Um, and then finally, it is a tale told by an idiot, and the idea of the idiot links back to the idea of the fool. And I wonder if Macbeth somewhat sees Lady Macbeth as this idiot or fool, um, someone who lit up his life for a short while but made some foolish decisions um, that amounted to nothing. Um, and then again, remember, we've got that final, final word of this little queen, nothing. And that just drops so heavy, doesn't it? And you've got the extended silence that we've already discussed coming after it. So you can see absolutely loads of annotation there. Now, my last lesson that I recorded for you, um, I talked about um, like which scenes I thought might or might not come up when we look through um, Act 4 and Act 5. And I said, yeah, this one probably would, this one probably wouldn't. And this speech here, I think it's really, really likely that this will come up at some stage. Um, it's a really famous speech. Um, it's like a really universal speech because it's not just about Lady Macbeth. I think it's something which connects with anyone really who is suffered from depression, anyone who has been down in that dark pit, anyone who feels themselves wading through treacle, life going on at a petty pace and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and just having to drag yourself through each next day trying to get to the next day. It's so, um, it, it resonates with anyone who has suffered from those kind of feelings about the meaningless and nothingness of life and perhaps that's the reason why it might be picked um, for, um, for an exam extract. Okay, a um, couple of tasks to finish off. I'd like you to watch Patrick Stewart performing this soliloquy. Um, so again, the link is going to be in the description underneath. The link's also going to be in a card. Um, so if you click on the info icon above, um, then you should see a link to Patrick Stewart and the Ian McKellen one as well. And you can just click straight onto that and watch Patrick Stewart performing this soliloquy. And then I want you to have a think about these questions when you've watched it. Did you prefer Patrick Stewart or did you prefer Ian McKellen? Explain why you preferred the one that you did. Now, McKellen and Stewart, they're old friends. They were really good friends even before they did the X-Men movies. Um, do you think that Patrick Stewart watched that old workshop from 1979. Do you think he did? If you do think he did, explain why. If you don't think he did, explain why as well. Okay, and just one more slide to go and then we finish my birth. Yay. Okay, so I've made a bunch of statements here just for you to think about before we finish Macbeth. Which one do you agree with most thinking about that speech tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow? Do you think that this speech is about Macbeth suffering from depression? Lady Macbeth was the one who gave his life meaning and now that she's dead, he's sunk into a pit of despair and he thinks that everything is meaningless. Do you think that there is an element of Macbeth blaming Lady Macbeth because she drove him to make bad choices in his life's yesterdays? 
and that's made a fool of him and leading him now to dusty death. When Macbeth says, out, out, brief candle, is he thinking mainly about his wife's fragile life, the fragility of her specific life, or is he thinking about everyone's life being fragile, like a feeble candle flame, a bit like um, I was discussing that Elton John song. And do you get the impression, do you agree that Macbeth resents the way that Lady Macbeth forced him to disguise his true feelings throughout the play? Is that why he's now using this extended metaphor of saying that life is just like a really, really rubbish actor. So can you think about which statements you agree with the most and write those down in your book and see if you can justify why you agree with those. Okay, so don't forget to download the resources from the description underneath. Go back through the video if you need to make any extra notes or go through anything again. And if you do have any questions about Macbeth, either send me an email, put a comment below or get in touch with me any other way. See you soon. Bye bye.